It is September 5th, 2017. This is Ashton Ellett. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia with Mr. Fred Cooper. Uh, we are doing an interview for the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper, for joining us. Um, let's start off by, you know, tell me a little bit about you know, your childhood, your upbringing, before you know, we really dig into your political life and experience. Thank you, Ashton. I'd be delighted to. I'm a Georgian. I was born in Thomasville, Georgia, in the rural southwest corner of the state of Georgia. My family moved around throughout the south from the time I was born there. We moved away when I was just three or four years old, and my family ended up back there just before I finished college, went to college. I graduated from high school in Greenville, South Carolina. Went to undergraduate school at Washington and Lee University, law school at the University of, of Georgia. Spent several years in the Army after that, and then embarked on a career of practicing law and being with a very large corporate uh, entity that was in the baked foods business, headquartered in Thomasville. So how, how, how do you go from Law, how did you make that transition from law into to business and then into politics? Yeah, I'm not even sure I know myself. It was maybe more <laughs> accidental than anything. I studied history and English in undergraduate school. I knew I wanted to learn law. I went to law school, as I said, at the University of Georgia. I practiced law in a very small firm, one other person and me in Thomasville, and there was a company that was a started by a family in Thomasville in the baked foods industry. They were very small, but I was asked by the chairman of that company if I would join the company as its first general counsel. And I said, what will your general counsel be doing? And he said, I don't know, we've never had one, <laughs> but it'll be whatever you make it, which was a really outstanding opportunity for me to get into a position like that with a company that ended up growing very rapidly primarily by acquiring other bakeries. I was very heavily involved with that, which gave me a substantial amount of background in business and in law because they're so closely related, what you can do legally and how you negotiate transactions of that nature. So it was a very happy arrangement from my standpoint. And I was there for 17 years and moved from its first general counsel to being president and vice chairman of the company the last five years I was there. So you went to Washington Lee, um, been in the news recently. Um, well, Robert E. Lee has. What, what were your experiences in politics while you were in college? Washington Lee has an outstanding uh, reputation and something they've been doing for a large number of years. Every four years, they have a mock convention for the party that is not currently in the, op occupying the White House. So when I was a senior, we had a Republican nominating convention. I chaired one of the, of the state uh, delegations to that, and we nominated Barry Goldwater. Now, it's not just a popular vote of the students. The students are, across the board, involved very deeply with each of the 50 states at the time, knowing all the incoming delegates and so forth, talking to them about what their thoughts were. And when we nominated Barry Goldwater, it's all, that mock convention has always been covered very closely by the national news media because it has such an outstanding record for accuracy, and it still does to mm -hmm. this day. Well, the press told us they thought this was supposed to be something that wasn't just a bunch of students voting there's no way, they said, there's no way in the world Barry Goldwater doesn't get the nomination. Well, sure enough, he did, which was another in the cycle of accuracy. And it was a wonderful, it wasn't just a fun, while it was enjoyable, it wasn't just a fun opportunity. It was the fact that you really do learn an awful lot when you're thrust over a couple of years, you're working on it to make sure you understand how this wonderful political system works in this country. Did you follow? politics before you went to Washington Lee, before you got involved in no, that mock convention? Since I grew up in Georgia, I um, was not really had the opportunity to weigh the difference between one party and the <laughs> other because the Republican Party did not exist in Georgia by any real stretch of the imagination. Um, but that did give me an insight into the difference in the two parties between mm -hmm. uh, 
Lyndon Johnson was the sitting president at the time. Uh, the Democratic Party was somewhat different. It is to this day they're different from the Republican Party, but the two parties have swapped positions on different things and so forth. But no, I was not heavily involved, but from that point on, I got heavily involved when I graduated right after the mock convention at Washington and Lee. I was heavily involved, became sort of the, in, the campaign manager for a young person named Harry Wingett, who was running for Congress from the second congressional district, which is, was then and still is the southwest corner of the state of Georgia. Harry Wingett had worked as a chief counsel to the Senate Armed Services Co Committee, working for uh, Senator Russell, a, a Democratic senator from Georgia, highly regarded across the board Absolutely. within this state and nationally as well. And Harry was running as a Democrat, so my first taste of politics was chairing the campaign for someone who was running as a Democrat, and he went into a runoff, and the runoff, I think there was less than 100 votes difference in the con congressional race, and H Harry lost by just a handful of votes and was defeated by someone in the primary, and of course, whoever won the primary was that was tantamount to being elected in the general election mount, because there right. were no Republicans running in opposition. So what did that experience, and then also growing up, um, being however many generations you know, of a Thomasville resident, what did that teach you about the political culture in South Georgia it, it, during the, the late, the, the early 60s and stuff well, like that? Well, essentially everyone I knew, including my, my um, uh, father was somewhat surprised when I didn't understand why he was a Democrat, but he, I'm not sure if he really was. Most of the people who lived in the South, and especially Georgia, were very conservative, but they were members of the Democratic Party because of a lot of historical issues and sure. so forth. So sure. almost everyone claimed conservatism, but they did not really seri give, give serious consideration to voting except in presidential races. And the South was carried by Mary Goldwater. That was really the first race that had a significant impact on the two parties at the presidential level. So you, you after you, you ran Harry Wingate's campaign, did you just then move into business? Or, or you actually, you, that was your military experience after that. Well, not quite yet. I, that was following my graduation from undergraduate school. I went straight to the University of Georgia to law school, was okay. there for three years, and then I went on active duty in the okay. Army and served for several years before I moved back to Thomasville mm -hmm. after my term of service and went into private practice for a short period of time and then joined Flowers Industries beyond that. Flowers Industries had a political action committee uh, which was focused entirely on federal races and it's funded by the employees to give money to it and then the gr group that actually operated it made contributions and a lot of those contributions also went to the Democratic candidates because early on where we were located at the time most of the, can most of the people were practicing Democrats mm -hmm. but that changed dramatically while I was there. It, two things happened. One is I think I became more and more convinced that the Republican Party was the party of conservatism defined by its view of a number of different things. Capitalism being a primary area of understanding the capitalistic system and why it worked. Understanding free markets. Understanding the need to let the government be as limited in its focus on different policy issues and so forth as possible. That appealed to me, and it was during that period of time when I was at Flowers Industries that although I had not been really active, I had been involved in Reagan's campaign to some extent. I had been very heavily involved in Mac Mattingly's campaign, mm -hmm. who was the first Republican United States Senator elected in Georgia since, since the Civil War, over a period of 130 years. And because of that involvement, I chose to run for chair of the Republican Party in Georgia and was elected in 1981. So before, before you, you ran for state party chairman, you were involved in, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the Republican Senatorial Trust? 
during the 1970s? Yes, yeah, so the Senatorial tell, Trust tell me about was an that. organization at the federal level that uh, it was a fundraising effort, but it was to maintain, make sure that the Republicans were able to hold the number of senators they had trying to move towards uh, control of okay. the, of the, uh, the party that was in the majority in the, in the United States Senate. I was active in that. I was active in that when Mac Mattingly was running. Because I was active, that organization, at least nobody believed me when I told them I was confident that Mattingly would defeat the incumbent uh, Senator Herman uh, Talmadge. But he did. He won, not by a gigantic thing, but he won the race, and the Senatorial Trust had given them a good bit of him a good bit of money for his campaign. And that was just one step forward even more to understand the, the relationship between being for a candidate who happened to be in your hometown or your, your state or the United States Senate. And Mattingly did a superb job in mm -hmm. that position and was uh, very effective, quite frankly, in supporting me when I um, ran for state chairman, as did Newt Gingrich, who was, those were the only two elected people that we knew as Republicans in the state at the time I ran for chairman of the state party. So 1981 rolls around. The, the Republicans um, nationwide and in Georgia more successful than they had been in a number of years. Um, there was an incumbent state party chairman who was also running for re-election. Why, why did you choose to run in 1981 I for think, that position? I think I was actively enough involved in Mattingly's campaign. Um, I think I had gotten to know him well. I had gotten to know uh, certainly Gingrich very well. Paul Coverdale was a friend of mine who was a state senator at the time and a lot of other people because of my active involvement in the Mattingly race encouraged me to run. And I looked at the party as it existed at the time. There was, there was no real interest or uh, attention given to raising money, which mm. is exactly what is needed to be successful in elections. But you also have to have really good candidates being recruited. And I think those were the two things that I was most focused on talking about that during the campaign for the state chairmanship, but also the things that I refocused really on when I won uh, against the incumbent, uh, Matt Patton. But I think we also did a lot of different things. We staffed the um, state party headquarters mm -hmm. with a full-time executive director and put in some staff people to make sure that we could help candidates who were running under the Republican Party banner to help them do things to create a very really meaningful, well-conducted, well-planned, and well-conducted campaign. So you mentioned at least two things, two things that I really want to dig into. Fundraising. Lifeblood of politics is fundraising. How, how was the program, the fundraising program that you devised and implemented, how was that different than what came before? Um, put well, in place if, in Georgia. If measured in terms of dollars, it was dramatically different because my first year we raised a great deal more than the party had raised the year before. Mm -hmm. But I always like to look seriously at what uh, I had learned in prior examples. I had raised money for the United Way and that type thing. Raising money was something that's not easy. It requires organization. Right. And uh, I think the fact that I was participating in the Republican Senatorial Trust, which you asked about earlier, that was one of the real successful fundraising efforts at the national level to, in support of candidates running for the United States Senate. So I had learned from that type thing and tried to create models like that in Georgia. We didn't set it up exactly the same way, but I came from a business by this time with Flowers Industries, was the leading baked foods company in America primarily in the southeast and some a little bit in the Midwest, but quite frankly, uh, that company today is a gigantic company. It has, is in the baked foods business all over America. Sure. But that type of organization that I was involved with, with running a very growing, meaningful operation, these things carry over from one focus to another, and I think that had a lot to do with it. Because I was heavily involved in business, I had learned and became friends with a lot of 
successful business people across the state from very large corporations down to smaller ones and I just made a very systematic effort to go to each one of them. Most of these people were accustomed to living in a strong partisan democratic state but most of them in their heart and soul just like I had had that transition myself understood that their policy, their political philosophy and so forth was much more at home with people who were conservative wanted the free market system. They wanted the private sector to be making as many decisions as possible, not just letting the government enter into everybody's life doing things to try to run every aspect of an individual's life. And that's what I think followed me from being in business. I, I, served, I stayed with Flowers Industries while I was chairing the party, which meant I was really doing two full-time jobs, but I Absolutely. think that I was Maybe I didn't get as much sleep as I should have during that <laughs> period of time, but I think that um, it was something that was rewarding to me to sort of be in the middle and watch with a whole lot of other people that were helpful and very supportive of the things that I was trying to get done and done as accurately and as effectively as possible. Who did, did you bring anybody on board with you to help implement this financial program, this fundraising program into the party? Well, someone that a lot of people in Georgia will probably know that uh, one of the people that I asked if he would run alongside of me when I ran for state chairman was Joe Rogers. Mm -hmm. Those of you who do not know him, his, he and his family started the Waffle House Company. He has been running it for, uh, uh, this was 30 years ago when I was running the state party. He was my, not just my right hand man, he was the person who was he and I working together raised an awful lot of money uh, that we could not have otherwise raised had we not had this, the degree of organization and structure of putting together a way to make sure we weren't just talking to people on an indiscriminate fashion, but going to people we felt right. would like to see the party grow and become more successful across the board in Georgia. How aware were you or Mr. Rogers of the, the, the financial, the fundraising reforms being put in place? within the Republican National Committee at that time by uh, Dick DeVos, Betsy DeVos's, the, the current Education Secretary's father. Well, uh, if, uh, if they're doing their job well, they've already raised, asked both of us to give money to them. So yeah, we, we knew them, but as the Republican National Committee is made up of three people from each state, the state party chairman, which was position I held, a national committee man and a national committee woman, and those mm -hmm. three are on that board essentially, and are the it's the organization that sets the rules and makes the decisions for the Republican National Committee. So I was an active active participant in that. We've already talked a little bit about the Republican Senatorial Trust, which was an arm of the Republican Party designed to make sure that they were electing, and then hold on, Brian. All right, before we, we took a break, we were talking about the, the RNC um, and financing during your term as chairman, so 81, 82, um, right in there. Well, the, the Republican Party, as I said a lot ago, is comprised of people from each of the states. We're on the Republican National Committee. I was also involved with the Senatorial Committee. There also was a, con a Republican National Congressional Committee that does the same thing for people who are either already in the House of Representatives or running for that position. So our primary focus here was to have people running for those offices and helping raise money and keep the people uh, at the national level apprised of what was happening in each one of those different races. Well, we had more people running for Congress as Republicans when I was a state chairman than we'd ever had before. That took a lot of of not only uh, recruitment of a lot of those people, but more importantly, convincing them that um, well, we would help them raise money and so forth, and we were successful in doing that. And I think that we were looking at doing it at the state level and so forth. We had a Republican running for the governor for the first time in years uh, who ran, but at that point, we still did not have the strength across the state for statewide, right? but we were building it then and continued to do that with a lot of leadership within the state that developed more and more with a, it was more of a united group of a lot of different people who saw the wisdom and benefit to the country of having Georgia have a meaningful, competitive two-party system rather than just one party in the state. You, you mentioned a, a, 
a relatively coherent, you know, cohesive unit. Um, in Paul Coverdell, Bob Irvin, Newt Gingrich, Mac Mattingly. What brand, what brought all you all all, all of you together? Um, at that particular time? I think it probably was a common interest. We may have come from sort of different directions, but I think that what we, what we felt, I think, as people who had, Paul Coverdell was already in the state senate. We had two or three, we had, I think we had a total of five uh, state senators, mm -hmm. 11 or 12 members of the Georgia House of Representatives, now that obviously today, we have a majority in each one of those two uh, parts right. or two pieces of the, of the Georgia uh, General Assembly. But also we've had now two governors, the first two governors elected as Republicans. We've had both senators as Republicans now for some period of time, ta starting with Mattingly, Paul Coverdell, uh, Ch Staxby Chambliss, now David Perdue. So we've had that um, strength continuing to, to rise so that today uh, this state is predominantly Republican, including at the national level, the people running as Republicans for the United States, uh, President of the United States, whether it's in the primary season or whatever, we've got very active participation. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to your question is that nobody was trying to uh, see how important it was to them personally. Everybody involved, that you, the names that you just mentioned, they were people who early on understood the importance of the hard work, raising the money, having people understand the difference between the two parties. And I think that rather than it being something that was really done by a few people, that group continued to grow and get stronger and stronger because we we built a party that wasn't just centered in Atlanta, which is where it had been when I was mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. from a small town in South Georgia. The Republican Party today has people elected across the state, and we have carried essentially every section of the state and that in statewide and national elections now for some period of time. How important wa was federal patronage to the party during your chairmanship? I think it's always important it was something that um, it, patronage is obviously an area that sort of to the victor goes the spoils. I never felt that that what would, ought to be driving us. I thought that people who had worked hard in the Republican Party, we'd really never had a chance to have people serving within the state or federal level that um, may be people who had the capability for us to have people appointed to the bench, whether it's to the statewide uh, judicial positions or federal positions of U.S. attorneys and that type thing. And the party was very active in that area because we were called on to make recommendations to the president when we had a Republican president, mm -hmm. as we did through all of my involvement, both with respect to Reagan and George H.W. Bush, uh, being in office as presidents during our time of dealing with patronage. And I think that what we looked at it is we didn't want to just appoint someone who really would like to have the job or someone who thought that he or she was, we wanted to make sure that we created a party that people who understood, not just people who were running for office, but people who had been, a, been selected and appointed to office, either at the federal level or the state level, were people who were very, very competent, capable people and we've been able to do that through the governor's office and through the presidential office at the federal level. And I think that that in itself has helped create a lot more understanding, respect, and so forth for the people who are actively involved in the Republican Party in the state of Georgia. Let's take a step back to 1980. You've mentioned um, Mac Mattingly obviously running for Senate, but there was a big presidential election that year. And, and I don't think that many people appreciate how divided the Republican Party in Georgia actually was during that election, uh, at least the primary season with, the, with, with Ronald Reagan running, George H.W. Bush, um, John Connolly, who, who was by that time a Republican, uh, who was also running. How did, how did that divide the state, uh, at least in terms of the, the Republican Party, a Republican activist? I think the Republican Party itself was small enough that it really was difficult to the vast majority of the people in the state were Democrats. Sure. 
there wasn't a large number of people that called themselves Republicans, and those who were were probably uh, involved in their local hometown or whatever as it grew, but by and large, it was not easy to have it a very, very clear line drawn between different groups. I'll tell you how it broke down. Sure. Uh, the person who was, and I keep it a few, in the context of what you just asked during the campaign for state party chairman, uh, one of the people, two people who supported me were Mac Madding, who had just been elected, and uh, Newt Gingrich. The individual who had supported my opponent, who was an incumbent state chairman, was also the person who ran uh, Reagan's campaign in Georgia. And there were a lot of people who followed him, because people that he had put together to run that election. A lot of people who followed me because uh, Mac especially had just been elected to the United States Senate. He was very openly involved in my election and, and endorsed me. So you really had two different groups at that time when I was elected. Right. There were probably a lot of other issues at the federal level and so forth, but the Republican Party was not so clearly developed that it's really fair to say there were two different uh, parts of the state that went into two different camps and then fought each other. I think that I certainly did not think that I wanted to be presiding over a party that was half its size because only half of them were for me. I wanted to make sure that I put together an organization that was unified in growing the Republican Party to win elections. You can always have people that disagree on some points and so forth, but I think the, the hallmark of what we were trying to do is build the party not defeat the other people in the party, but try to in, put your arms around. A lot of people opposed me, but I, put, I wanted to make sure I brought them in to be part of a party that was growing from that point forward. And I think some of my best friends were people who voted against me. <laughs> but I hope that was because they liked the, the, what we were doing during that period of, of the development of the party at a somewhat different level of involvement and size and understanding of exactly what the party really did stand for. So in 1982, um, there is a, a governor's race, and there had always been a significant amount of discussion within the party of whether to offer a candidate for, for governor, because this was such a, a, Georgia was such a strongly democratic state that there was always concern that a governor's race might actually hurt the party or set it back. Um, thinking back to 1974, discussions in 1978, whether to run a governor. Tell us about Bob Bell and Bob Bell's campaign and, and, and what you think the, the impact of that election on the party was in 1982. Bob Bell was a sitting state senator, a very highly regarded person, a businessman, a very decent individual that ran uh, while I was in, at state chairman. We had typically, as you have just indicated in your question, had some difficulty of getting people to run as a Repu Republican. A lot of people said, you know, on the national level, I liked Barry Goldwater better than I liked Johnson, the same thing with some of the other races at the national level, but here in Georgia, they realized they couldn't get elected if they called themselves Republican because there were far more Democrats. Now that we've overcome by having today far more Republicans than we had when I started off as state chairman. But Bob was a great person to be in that position. He ran a very uh, competitive race for the first time that had happened. Uh, he was a person that succeeded me, he came after me as the state mm -hmm. party chairman. And I think that we've had a number of people, I won't try to remember all the names right here, but it included everybody from uh, Paul Coverdell and others who were willing not only to serve in a, in a public office to which they were, had been elected, but also people who had worked together as we built this, uh, I'll call it sort of the, the, the central aspect of the Republican Party or the heart and soul of it were people who were looking at exactly the same results, not just as a stepping stone to run for another office, but to build a party that could help other people get elected to office. In some instances, we developed really good candidates mm -hmm. who became part of that team of people who were working, and many of them serve in Congress and so forth. For years now, we've had a substantial majority of the United States congressmen and women, by the way, look at who we just elected in this That's last right. 
uh, series out of the 6th Congressional District, we have had, we have far more Republicans elected from the state of Georgia than we have Democrats. Absolutely. Um, and you, know, you stepped down, as, as you indicated, you stepped down um, after 19, after the 1982 cycle, it might have been early 1983 when the official handover of power. Why, why did you decide to, to extricate yourself from, from state, the state party at that time? Well, I, I, would, I would try to change one um, word you use. Feel free. Extricate, Feel free. if I may, because I didn't want to do anything other than the fact I said earlier I was still employed by Flowers mm -hmm. Industries. I was in a vice presidential position and general counsel. During that period you just mentioned, towards the, towards the end of my term, I was promoted to executive vice president, and there was pretty clear indication that it may be a step above that before too long, and I realized that it's impossible to run what it, by this point had become a Fortune 500 company. And I could not run that and continue providing the same level of attention and time and so forth to the state party. And what I essentially did is at one of the, our meetings about three months before it was over, I just announced that I was being a, I was being a promote. I had just been promoted to executive vice president of Flowers. I would be more than glad to wait and let this process go with it. But this was before the the committee, the state committee. They had the power to elect, and they elected the person we talked about a few minutes ago, who had just run. He was the Republican Party's candidate for governor in the prior election, and he was elected at that point. It was not. I have not. Fallen by the wayside, I stayed involved <laughs> with each one of the presidential races. I was George Bush's campaign chairman in Georgia, mm -hmm. both when he ran and was elected and also when he ran for re-election. I've done the same thing since then with his son. I've been heavily involved in both Mitt Romney's campaigns and that type thing. I was very much involved in Jeb Bush's campaign and in the most recent uh, campaign, but he did not make it through the primary. But I've also done the same thing with essentially every statewide office. I've been involved in each of the governor's races. I've been involved in each of the Senate races and so forth. So I've still been there, but I just really realized if I was going to be able to buy groceries at the end of the week, I had to have a, a day job as well. And that's the reason I felt I needed to fall back and have someone else. I didn't want to see uh, the things that we had done with a lot of people working together didn't want to see that just die because I just suddenly stepped aside or got defeated sure, in a sure. subsequent election. But I think that has worked awfully well because Bob was then succeeded by a number of very, very capable people through the, through the years. You mentioned George H.W. Bush's presidential campaign. Very contentious. Um, not necessarily the primary wasn't very contentious here in Georgia, but what happened afterwards in terms of Republican politics uh, in Georgia um, walk, walk us through, if you will, the, the, the caucuses and convention process that unfolded in 1988. Um, well, the process is the same every year for, um, obviously, the president of the, the presidential candidates at the party level are determined by delegates who are elected at the local level, first in the primary, excuse me, in the precinct level, then on to the county level, then to the congressional level, and through a somewhat complicated process, you end up with a certain number of delegates going to the national convention right. and alternates. And that has been a process that's uh, served this country very well for years. You do the same thing in the Democratic Party. All right, before we cut off, we were talking about the 1988 um, Republican presidential nomination process in Georgia. How? Um, Republicans in the state actually nominate their, their delegation slates um, to, to the National Convention. Sure, let me pick up with that because just remember that from our standpoint, we want to elect a Republican to office. Now typically in any presidential election, I discuss generally how you start at the very low level of the, as far as a political organization is at the precinct level. There are several precincts in every county and several counties in every Center, uh, congressional district, and using that process, you end up sending a number of people to the actual convention that was to be held in order to nominate the Republican candidate. When you have a number of different candidates, when obviously you have different people having different favorites, 
And as part of the leadership in the state, what we tried to do as best we could is not alienate each other. We didn't mm -hmm. want to have our guy or woman win and then have no, none of the other people willing to vote for that candidate in the general election. It's really about who can beat the Democratic Party candidate, not how we end up with a party candidate just within our party. So yeah, it's, it's competitive. That's what politics is all about. We learned what it was like not to have anybody running at the statewide <laughs> level or in a, in a convention because we just didn't have that many Republicans in Georgia. But we have built the party in large measure by trying to embrace the people who were supportive of someone else. If their candidate doesn't get the nomination, they'll be in, hopefully in the same tent with all the rest of us making sure that the candidate who got the nomination is in fact elected in the general election against the Democrat. So 1980, it, as I said, the primary wasn't necessarily that competitive. George H.W. Bush, who was at the time the sitting vice president, won the primary vote by a relatively large margin. Yes, he did. Um, and and the, there were other candidates in that race, uh, Jack there were, Kim, there were. Uh, Bob Dole. But the one who, who emerged to be the most competitive in the state was actually Pat Robertson, the televangelist from, from up in Virginia. Yes, Walk us through how and why that became a competitive uh, well, it process. Was, it certainly wasn't unique to the state of Georgia. Sure. There has been for a number of years, and again, we are looking to bring more and more people who have the same interest in terms of choosing our elected people holding public office, whether that's a congressional level, a Senate level, a governor's level, president's level, or whatever it may be. And I think that the entire uh, part of politics saw d developing in the 80s a larger number of groups that were primarily driven by religious beliefs and okay. different issues, and they would and they were turned out. Pat Robertson was a product of the of the religious part of the world. He he was a preacher who was on television. People knew him and so forth, and he offered very strong opposition, which meant he had a strong following. We, uh, we had our, our share of battling as we're trying to select delegates at the precinct level right on up, but the system worked. And we ended up with a national convention. At the national convention, there was, you know, there were people from both, uh, from all, representing all of the candidates because what we wanted to make sure of is we didn't cut somebody out. Your candidate lost, you're not going to be a Republican anymore. We won't try to make sure that our delegation, just like every other delegation from all the other states, were people who were bound together to try to elect the person that they together had nominated. And yes, it's not, it's not always fun because not everybody is going to deal with it in the most, um, you know, it's patting each other on the back. But I think Georgia has not only survived, but it has in all likelihood been successful in large measure because we embraced each other. That didn't mean we didn't have different issues that we disagreed on and, and that type of thing, but we did realize in the final analysis, we wanted to have a team that was coming together when you had a primary nomination behind one person, whether it's at the governor's level or whatever, that we could win. The ultimate battle is in the general election with the opposition, with at least one of the parties, the, 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 the Democratic Party, but sometimes you have people running as an independent, and we have been successful in holding that together. When you did get to the nominating convention, there was um, a, the National Committee woman at the time was also a Thomasville, Georgia resident, Marguerite she Williams. She was. Um, she was one who, who did feel a little bit put out by the process. T tell us a little bit, she's a very colorful character in, 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 in Georgia history, Col Georgia politics. Colorful is an understatement. And, and, I, don't, I, don't, and I, don't, I think that, that's, that's underappreciated. And I can and say that because I have known her all my life. She was the same age and a dear friend of my parents, both of whom grew up in Thomasville. She has the good, had the, she's no longer living, but she had the good fortune of, ha, a, and the family, the person that she married was the heir to a very, very large, well-known company, a very wealthy family, and she was a very generous person, a person who loved the Republican Party and 
gave money to Republican candidates across the state, was delighted that Georgia was developing a stronger and stronger party. And I said earlier, there are three people from each state that are part of the Republican National Committee. She was the National Committee woman. She had had that position for some period of time. Well, in the, in the battle between, I'll call it generally, those people who were supportive of Bush, those people who were supportive of Pat Robertson, sort of weren't entirely, the, the people who supported Pat Robertson wanted to have more control, if you will, of the Republican Party. So that did sort of enjoin a pretty strong battle as to who would actually be able to elect a lot of different people and lead the party and so forth, which became more and more of an issue that year. We overcame it. I think that's the most uh, effective way to say that we outgrew it because we did not want to end up having a battle between two different groups within the party as much as having all of us focused on the ultimate ability to win by voting together, and we've done that. We have tried to make sure that what we, we had an, oppor an opportunity at that point with one of the votes came to select who the national committee woman was. There were more votes on the Pat Robertson side for that, and Marguerite Williams lost that position. She had raised a lot of money. She had given a lot of money. It was not a real sensible thing for, the, for that <laughs> element of the party to cut her off because she had done so much in helping to build the Republican Party in Georgia and nationally, by the way. Sure. But I think that you can at the time that a lot of the people who were followers of Pat Robertson had no real meaningful experience like the rest of us had. And I think that was damaging in our ability to come together in a unanimous way of dealing with something. But to Marguerite's credit, no, she didn't like it, but she stayed involved, which is very important. But I can understand why she was, her feelings were hurt because she felt that they had, people had voted against her that should not have, and she was right. But politics is not an easy game. It's not a game. It's a very serious world, but there are certain rules, and it's the, the rule, the major rule is whoever gets the most votes wins. And they're like, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people will lose an election or come very close but just barely fail, and you have to be prepared to take that and then move on and continue to build the party, which we have continued to do, even though that was not a particularly enjoyable part of it because I personally knew her very, very well. She had been very supportive of me. So in 1988, you were the state campaign chair for, for George H.W. Bush? George H.W. Bush. What, what were your responsibilities in that position? Making sure that he carried the state of Georgia. The ultimate responsibility, but <laughs> more specific than that. Um, during the primary, you've got to make sure that you help get enough delegates that will support your candidate when there are a lot of other people doing the same thing. You want to make sure that you have the ability once your candidate gets nominated, which you set out, all of us set out to do the same thing, but one person was going to end up having led the team that won the primary election in terms of the number of delegates went to the national convention. I think it's important to look at what each one of us had to do. We had to make sure we put together people that would work at the precinct level and everything else in support of not only the candidate that you supported that got the nomination, but bring in all these other people. Mm -hmm. What I talked about a while ago, you don't want to fight so much among yourselves that you can't win the ultimate election. And I think we did that well. We opened our arms to bring people into it. We raised money together and all the things that you have to do. We wanted to make sure that we had the money to put together a campaign to win the election in the state of Georgia against the Democrat. And you put together a whole new team of people who are for your candidate. It's a much larger thing. You're campaigning every day from that day forward, having people in every square inch of the state of Georgia putting out yard signs, putting together fundraising efforts, putting together groups of people who meet in someone's house and talk about why that candidate should be voted, making sure that you do all the things that turn out the people to vote on the election day. And that's something that I had the benefit of having run the Republican Party. I probably had an, an advantage because I knew so many Republicans across the state. And then it became my responsibility to make sure as many good leadership people who had been in positions of responsibility within the Republican Party could now go out and help elect the candidate that I was in chairing his campaign for the United States presidency. 
What did that experience teach you about um, running statewide in future elections? I was involved in several, much the same. I think once you've done it, it's, the next step is easier, but none sure. of it's really easy. <laughs> but once you put together a team and keep together, I was running Paul Coverdale, I've talked about, and Matt Mattingly was running subsequent elections. So was, so was right, Newt. Right. So you, you, you've got the list, all these people who are coming together, you know who, will do, who, who are the people who will work hard, who are the people you can have confidence in that will be, make sure they carry their precinct or their county in the, in the final analysis. They're willing to work hard and get the job done. And that one, my, my own campaign was a little different than the, this one running for state chairman. This was getting votes across the state to vote for the same person, and I think every time I did this, I did that for not only George H. W. Bush, but his son uh, uh, Jeb, uh, uh, George W. Bush right. was um, when I did that for. Also, I was heavily involved in each of the campaigns for governor since then that we have run. I was very much involved in a lot of congressional races and so forth including that most recent one here when Karen Handel was elected as a congresswoman from the 6th district in, in the state of Georgia. Were you involved in Johnny Isaacson's run for governor in 1990? I was involved in uh, one of his races. I'm trying to think which one it was. I think I was not involved. He, we, he and I have been friends. He was in the state's house and in the right. Senate when I was state chairman, so I've known him for years. I think mm -hmm. we have a mutual high regard for each other. I was also, I think in one of those, I was with one of his opponents that I had talked into running for that office before Johnny decided he was going to run, but Johnny uh, ended up uh, losing to the candidate that got the nomination, but then he went back into the state uh, general assembly, and obviously once he was elected, to the United States Senate, he has not lost an election, I th nor, I think has he had, has, nor has he had meaningful um, opposition. Right, right. I, I think you're referring to Guy Milner. I did um, not want to use a name, okay. but, <laughs> well, we, uh, but I don't mind doing okay. it. No, I, okay. I, listen, I've never supported someone I wouldn't, but I, I convinced Guy to run. Sure, sure. And then, and then he did run. He did, uh, uh, win the nomination, but he did not win the, the governor's race. Right, okay, and, and this, we're talking about 1994. Yes. Um, Guy Milner runs three consecutive statewide elections, two for governor in 94 and 98, and one for Senate in 1996. Correct. What do you think the, the, the impact, either short-term or long-term, of Guy Milner's three very close campaigns were for, for the Republican Party? I think any time you have someone who obviously is qualified, who is doing it for all the right reasons, which Guy, he was, he was a wealthy person, a very successful business person. He was able to fund himself a lot of those races. When you have a candidate who has run a close race every time, uh, he has not won statewide, a, a statewide election. He has gotten the nomination a couple of times that were very helpful. So when you have that type of thing happening, but as I said a while ago, every single race you're gonna have somebody, you have more people losing than people get, just cause you normally have multiple people running for the same mm -hmm. office. And a lot of them may lose, but that doesn't mean they weren't competent. It doesn't mean that they didn't help build the party because they're out there spending money that they've raised, saying all the right things about why they think they should be elected, which when you're saying essentially the Republicans agree on 90% of the things that are important to the people who call themselves Republicans, that helps build it. And I think Guy did that. And I think his elections were run uh, very well with all the right reasons. As I said, he could have been a very, very uh, appropriate public servant, but the people in Georgia chose not to select them, they, ch they chose someone else in each one of those races. Going through the 19, we, we talked a little bit about this with the 1988 uh, contest, but working our way up into Republican politics in the 1990s, um, the, the Christian right played an ever increasing role in those primary elections. And, and you've been called an establishment Republican from time to time. Uh, how, how was that so-called establishment able to blend itself, for lack of a better word, with that 
the, the culturally conservative, socially conservative element that, that very clearly wanted to be part of Republican politics. I think that those of us who were in that position, I, oh, I think that I, I owe it to myself to say just because I was part of what you call the establishment does not mean that I'm not a Christian, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. But I do think that a it, did a break, very fair point. it did break along a religious conviction in several significant issues that were the most important issues at the national level primarily, but also at the state level. Mm -hmm. Abortion being one of those, there were others, and I think that there was a, almost what was most important was let's make sure we have a candidate who believes in these three things. Right. And that's where their focus was. And we realized, we being the people that you call the establishment, the, the, those who were not as, they may have, they may have been even ambivalent. They thought those things were individual things that people who really felt strongly, but for religious reasons, whatever, fair game. They ought to stand up and say what they're for. But when you have what only, you, you are right, it became more and more powerful, but we wouldn't be where we are today if the, if the, religious right had won every single uh, battle, whether it was for party leadership, whether it was for, but I have always embraced them mm -hmm. because I realized that we wanted them voting with us. We wanted women voting with us. We wanted African-American people voting with us. We wanted a lot of different groups of people that may have had some interests that were fairly singular in purpose. And we realized that the Republican Party could not successfully grow and win elections unless we had a majority of the people in the state voting along the same lines. And I think that we have weathered that storm. There clearly are other people that had their own leadership, but I think the leadership, when I first got engaged with them, had no real sophistication in the way of how politics works. They were more inclined to say, we want to take control of the party and do it our way. But my objective was, I don't care who has control of the party, I want us to be winning elections by Republicans who are sending the right message to the people in the state and outside of the state. I think that initially nobody knew who was winning because none of us were. <laughs> Didn't matter who you <laughs> thought you were for as a Republican, but as we have overcome that, I think it sort of settled down there where you don't have quite so many races that are drawn just down that line because I think that people looking at it realize that I think Georgia is better off because it has a competitive two-party system and Republicans are not dominating as much as leading in almost every aspect of politics in this state. And I think that makes the state stronger and better. That, that, that leads me into the, the sort of next stage of questions. Um, why were the Democrats able to hold on to power in Georgia for so very long, e even after, as you've noted, most Georgians, um, at least a significant number of them, would classify themselves as conservatives. How were the Democrats able to, to maintain that majority in the state? Well, historically, it goes back to a lot of things. I won't go through the whole history, but Georgia had been a strong uh, state, most of the South, most of the people who lived in those states in the South consider, them, consider themselves uh, Democrats, not Republicans. So you started off with not a choice between Democrats and Republicans. It was all, I'm born in Georgia. My father, my grandfather was a Democrat. I must be one. So it was sort of a, that where you started with it. And then I think a lot of the things that I think we started changing in the early 80s is organizing because most of the people consider themselves Southern conservative Democrats. Essentially no difference between that and what Republicans at the national level mm -hmm. had stood for for some time. And I think we saw an opening there to move more and more people to a party at the national level. Really was more aligned with what all these people who were just Democrats by habit more than anything. And I think that we just through the candidates that we uh, recruited to run for office, the messages they were living and so forth caused more and more people to realize this is really where I ought to be and that's helped us grow. Now what happens when you have everybody is in one party and some people start 
where is everybody coming from? There's only way you can make a Republican is not bring somebody from another state. Well, some of that ha happened. Most of it came from the Democratic Party. They were, they were conservatives who liked, who moved from the Democratic Party to, I did. I was, I was, I wasn't a strong, I was young enough. I wasn't that much, I called myself a Democrat when I was in college. But I and a lot of people moved out. Now what has happened? The conservatives, the true conservatives, were pulling away over here in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Well, what did that leave in the Democratic Party? They were people who were the people that were felt more akin to a party that was dominated by organized labor, a very liberal philosophy for how government should be. Look at it today when you turn on television, it's the same thing today. Try to understand something that the Senator from the state of New York is saying he's against everything, but he's for extremely liberal positions that would have the federal government running everybody's life. And those who migrated away into the Republican Party were real happy. That's not where we were then, nor is it where we are now. The Democrats have been left in a pool all of their own. They have, they have really taken the primary basis of the Republican Party on a national level, which is extremely far to the left. And I think it's important for us now to really define more clearly the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The Democrats have done a pretty good job of trying to define Republicans as being against women, against African American people, against wealthy people, against capitalism, and we haven't stood up strong enough and said, let us tell you why we are in favor of these things. That's the way this economy has been based on the whole notion of a capitalistic society. That has become a dirty word thanks to the Democrats, but capitalism just simply means that you have, everybody has the freedom to do whatever they want to do, to go to whatever school they want to, to study whatever they want to, to start a business, go to work for a business, but in the final analysis, if you run that business better than your competitors, then more and more people will be able to work there. They'll have jobs. More and more people will have a better product because this company is going to provide not just one can of beans, but a lot of different cans of beans that are different varieties. And that really is what the whole notion of a free market where people can buy what they want, they can take whatever job they want or whatever it is, and I think that that's the future of the Republican Party to make sure people really do understand that it's the Republican Party that creates jobs. The Democratic Party wants to pay more people to work for the federal government. That money is coming out of individuals' pockets or taxes they have to have in order to do the things through the government rather than letting the free market system of private enterprise do it. The, the Democrats in Georgia have been out of power since Sonny Perdue was elected, um, and then it, the next couple years, the the state senate first flipped flipped from Democrat to Republican, and, and then finally the state you're, house. You're correct. To where we're at a point where the Democrat, the, excuse me, the Republicans have a sol solid majorities in, in both houses of the the General Assembly, correct, and the governor's mansion. What is or what are the greatest threats to that Republican majority? What could imperil? the Republican majority or Republican control of a state like Georgia? I think I, I did not intend to be answering that question when I just said what no, I did. No, sure, sure. But I will repeat it. Yeah. Because I think that what I just said is the solution or the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Republicans need to understand exactly what it is we do stand for. We need to sing that song as loudly and as convincingly as we possibly can so that fellow Republicans understand it but also people who are out here, either as Democrats, we've already moved a lot of them to our side of the ledger, but also how about all the independent people who really haven't made up their own mind? Mm -hmm. Why are we not making sure we're constantly building the Republican Party by saying in a very convincing fashion, this is what we believe and this is why we want you to join us. We want you to run for office in our party. And I think if we do that, we will keep ourselves from, sometimes success can lead to failure if you just say, boy, we've really done a good job, haven't we? Run the, <laughs> as you said, we, we, we have a majority in the state house and senate. Well, you don't just sit back and say how good we are. You sit back and explain why the people in Georgia have chosen the, that route. 
and that takes constant communication and intelligent uh, communication among people who may not fully understand the difference. When you were, you know, party chairman, and then then your your experiences in the eighties and nineties, there there were different factions. There were rivaling factions uh, of the party. Are those fact? Are, are there still factions that that um, divide Republicans, even even as they are the governing majority here? I think there will always be factions within. You know, look at your church. Does everybody in your church agree where the preacher should live or? <laughs> what time the services should start. The right. same thing is true in country clubs, where, you know, whether you're going to build another tennis uh, area or whether you're going to build a new swimming pool or right, whatever. Right, right. The same thing is true across the board with Little League and with everything else. What team do Little you League be politics on? is sometimes nastier than politics. <laughs> well, the parents politics. get too involved too much. <laughs> but seriously, I'm, I, I'm saying it off the top of my head as far as what it is, but I think that's a... That's a it's, it's, it's not all bad. It does force you to look inside and am I right? Am I making some mistakes? Am I saying the right thing? Am I using the right tactics? Not to go out and tell them they're crazy as a lunatic if they're a Democrat. <laughs> Explain to them why the Republican Party is better and what these, what these things read and what it means to you and your grandchildren through the years. And that's what I think you need. Leadership that understands it, that is constantly shouting that information to people. Every time they're on television, they should be talking about it. And quite frankly, too often, we have too many elected people who are more concerned with saying whatever they think that the, will get them the next vote. And that's probably the thing that's sadly dominating us in Washington today. Look at the, Washington is the, the United States Senate and the United States House, are both of them are controlled by the Republican Party. But they're not looking at what is across the board, they're not looking at what is best for the United States of America. There ought to be some compromises there with different issues, but mm -hmm. there is not quite enough of absolute conviction along exactly what you ought to do because the party does stand for these five things and make sure everybody understands why you're for it. And I'm not going to repeat them every time I have a chance, but it really does have an awful lot to do with realizing that the free market system is much better let just like the type problems you have right now with Obamacare or in a recent disaster down mm -hmm. in Texas really how should those issues be handled should the federal government just step up and say we'll pay for all of it well eventually the federal government owes so much money that you will never get out from under it and the entire country will go into bankruptcy because they're taking more from the people who are earning it and having jobs and earning it and paying taxes on it and corporations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And if you take too much of that, then you reduce those resources. If the government takes all of my money, I can't buy a new car or I can't go to, out to dinner and have a nice dinner because I don't have the money to because most of what I earn is going to be not only to, it's to the local, the state, the national level. And I think people are beginning to understand that more and we're going to see better how we handle it because in all likelihood tax reform across the board will be one thing that this administration, the president's office and the House and Senate will come to grips with, I hope, within the next 30 days. It's badly needed. We, we, we'll see with, 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 the, with the administration. Um, you know, up, to, up to this point, it, it's been uh, a bit of a slog legislatively. But I wanted to take a step back, and you know, historians, political observers, political journalists in Georgia say there's not really that much difference in terms of policy and approach to governance from, say, uh, a Democratic governor like Joe Frank Harris or Zell Miller than a Republican administration uh, like, like Sonny Perdue or Nathan Deal. What, what is the Republican approach to governance? How has it been different than, than some of those governors who, who were admittedly center, right, center to center right um, Democrats here in Georgia? I think that I, what I said a little while ago is the fact that we were able, we didn't go out and hijack people. They just drifted on their own the Republican Party. So they sort of self-selected right. where they are. So you'd almost have to ask them, why did you stay with this party? This party really is more well-defined at the national level than it is here. Yeah, most people in this state, a vast majority of them, do uh, 
agree, but there are also a lot of people who are in the Democratic Party right now who are far more liberal about an awful lot of issues that are more in keeping with organized labor and so forth that with respect to school systems as far as how much you're paying in, uh, teachers and all these type things. There are a lot of areas that are divided between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And I think that's good. It does go. But I wouldn't say that there's, I think that we started with a situation where what you described is almost the way it was. Mm -hmm. Over time, we've got a lot of different things that have affected the right to vote, which I think is what the citizens not only deserve, but they have. But I think those things have had somewhat of, of impact. Does that mean that the Republican Party should not be going out trying to get people from every race, people for, regardless of gender and so forth, involve all of them? And I think that's one of the things we have done. Are we doing it as well as we possibly could? Well, uh, I don't think we probably are because I think it's a full-time job to do it. Mm -hmm. But it ought to always be out there. And I think we've done it well enough to answer your question pretty well as of 15 or 20 years ago, but it also answers it right now. Because you, you don't, where you used, used to have everybody as a Democrat, less than half the people in the state call themselves Democrats today. It's not that we've won, it's we've offered a better way of governance. What do you think the issues are here in Georgia where Democrats and Republicans could work together, could compromise? What areas of, of government? I think that there's there's an area that probably needs it more than any, and mm -hmm. that is the school system. Okay. I think that it's important. Well, organized labor pretty well dictates what you can and cannot do in terms of hiring and firing teachers and that type thing. It does the same thing in in commercial operations where people are working for this company and they uh, are they they cannot just say and do anything they want to because they can't be fired for certain things without those things being uh, appropriate because of misbehavior and so forth. Organized labor tries to, that's all about the, the labor bosses, the ones who benefit. If they keep getting raises for these people and they take a lot of the money and satisfy their own selfish needs when it really is not the best way to run an organization. Let individual people decide what they want. Most states, Georgia being one of them, not everybody has the right to be or the uh, the right to be in an organized uh, labor union. That's not true in some states. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what is uh, the, in the particular issues. You could talk about the issues. There are some before the General Assembly every year that do go back within the Republican Party that deal with some of the issues that are very, very precious to people who have certain religious convictions for or against something. Sure. And they'll probably never be easy to always, because I think that's something that people do have the right to follow whatever their religious dictates are that they think are important. And that will always divide some people. Labor union activity will divide some people. Race will divide some people. But that doesn't mean that the parties are divided by saying it's just simply by whoever is running the party on each side, the people who really do want to have a party that stands for something that is very acceptable to a large number of people. I think you see that happening every day. There, there's been considerable discussion in, in the press, um, in political circles, that eventually demographic change, um, changing demography, the changing racial and ethnic makeup of Georgia's population, is going to make Georgia, if not a democratic state again, but a more competitive state. Where, where do you stand on that on that issue of, of demographics as sort of a, a political destiny for the well, state? Well, I think that there's no doubt if, uh, the, the way to find out, and you can do this easier than I can, you can go to the polls and see how people of one particular ethnic group, where they're from, mm -hmm. whatever it is, they have at least in a certain number of elections voted in a certain way. Now, each party probably tries to reach out and make sure that they are trying to provide the solutions that people of different backgrounds and religions and so forth uh, are already set for. But that's, it's not really within the control of the, either party as to who is going there. You know, we're right now, there's an awfully strong battle about immigration into this country. Right, right. And we don't really have clear evidence of exactly how all of the 
immigrants, whether they are here legally or have violated the law by coming here, exactly how they vote. But I think that you've identified an area which I think is problematic to the development of each of the two major parties as to how that turns out in the final analysis. And it goes back to a comment I made earlier. I think that we have real serious problems when the people elected the office and are making decisions in that elected position are thinking only about the people who vote in their district, a congressional district or a state or whatever. They want to make sure that they vote in a way that those different ethnic or other groups of people vote. They don't want to disappoint them. They don't want to even say something. They cause people to vote against them rather than voting for them. And I think that's not a really easily predicted uh, look at history mm -hmm. first and then look into the future and determine what you're going to be able to, um, to do. I think you have to have a whole lot of right-minded people who are patriotic and want what's best for this country in positions of leadership and hopefully they will always do what is right, not what is politically expedient. By the way, I'm not suggesting that only one party does all of that exactly right. <laughs> I didn't want to, I, I didn't, but, that, but you would agree, I mean, that's on, that's on both sides. Exactly, um, exactly. And, and what, I guess that carries me into my, my, my next point, which was Hillary Clinton, um, the Democratic candidate in 2016, only received about an estimated 20% of the white vote in Georgia. As demographics stand right now, no Democrat can win statewide office with just 20% of the white vote. How do Democrats go about, if you, if you want to offer some free advice to the Democratic Party of Georgia, how does the Democratic Party of Georgia begin to, to rebuild its brand, so to speak, with white voters in Georgia? Not that white voters are all monolithic. I and tell all. you what I would ex tell them to do, but I don't think they'd follow my advice. Well, sure. Stop going in one direction more and more and more into a pure, very, very liberal posture. Look at the woman who was a senator from Massachusetts today. Look at all the people. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth well. Warren. They are they are really way off in what I think is a fair uh, designation as being ultra-liberal. They want the government running everything. On the other hand, you have some re uh, people who are very conservative as to what the role of government is. How large should government be? What are the areas that the government should do only these things, not everything in the world? Because that does, and how much you should be taxing people, taking it away from the people who are working hard and using it to build government even more. That really is the defining difference between Republicans and Democrats. And I think that if we are, if people become more, they kind of like all the things that government does. It'll pay you not to work. It'll pay you to when you are sick. It'll pay you when you go to the hospital. They'll pay you when you get old. They'll pay you, and that's an awful lot of people in this country today are really kind of happy with that. Well, that's what she's. That's what uh, Hillary Clinton stood for, and I think that the people who don't agree with that have got to do a better job of defining what is right and good, not just that it's a noble thing to do, is because what happens if you forget that somebody has to pay the bills, and if you keep taking more and more from those people who are working hard, and the offensive people say, why should I work when someone else is getting welfare that I'm paying for, and why should I work and pay half of what I earn to the government? And though I think that what you're going, there are people normally do migrate in the direction that makes the most sense. It's either something that you really believe in a religion, why are mm -hmm. you in one church rather than another, you look at the area that you're most comfortable with. I'm most comfortable with the Republican Party. It doesn't do everything per uh, perfectly, and I understand that. But I think I've spent time myself, I think I'm not the only one, a lot of other people out there trying to make sure that we communicate what it is that's important to us so that we do have a country that's just as strong as it can be. It's not wondering what's going to happen over in North Korea right now, or whatever, because of the, it's, it's frightening to look at what's happening on an international basis and what we're fighting. We're fighting battles in the Middle East. We know we have potential battles across the board in a lot of different areas. And we're not unanimous within the 
the parties. Are. We're not providing as much support financially for them, but we're supporting, we're providing a whole lot of support at the federal level to people who have decided they just really not, don't want to work too hard. And I think that's, we're, we're causing an awful lot of people in this country to be very dependent on the federal government in order to pay for their food and so forth, rather than having people having the self-satisfaction of self-confidence and so forth that comes from all the things that you can have by raising a family, paying your children's way to the college and that type thing. That's what's built this country. Well, we're, we're, we're sort of talking around it, but I think we're still living in the, the, the after effect of the 2016 election. Um, as you said, you, you were uh, committed to, to Governor Jeb Bush's campaign. Um, he withdrew after, after the South Carolina primary, and that was obviously before the Georgia primary um, later in the spring. Donald Trump won carried Georgia in that, in that primary by a very wide margin. Uh, I believe the only other candidate to win a county in Georgia uh, was Marco Rubio, Florida senator. Um, what does that say about the Republican Party? Um, it's either its direction, what, what its voters or base wants, that, that Donald Trump was able to, without much of a, a political background, certainly a political experience within the Republican Party, enter the primary and, and, and compete with and defeat people like Jeb Bush, people like uh, a, a Chris Christie or a Marco Rubio, even a Ted Cruz uh, from a different sort of ideological wing of the party. What, do, what does that say about the party and how it's changed maybe since you became active in Republican politics in the 70s and 80s? You know, that's probably the most interesting question that you've put forward, and not that the others weren't, because I don't know that I know the answer to it, because this is such a dynamic world we live in. Yep. Uh, I don't know how you operate with an iPhone and that type thing, but we are all in a very high technology-driven world. We all watch television. We all are on the Internet, and it's how you get your message across and the thoughtfulness of that. I would suggest two things that were very, very different. Uh, Trump was not well-known. He ran a very, very different campaign. Oh, sure, sure. Some of us liked it. Some of us disliked it. Uh, Within the Republican Party, there was, and I think a lot of people who probably came in were probably not a member of either party. They may have been some independents or whatever, but he, he got an awful lot of people who were willing, wanted to have a candidate running who said what he thought. I think a lot of it was because people had gotten tired of Obama. I think that was one reason that drove sure, some people sure, in that camp. Sure. Some of it was because Trump was saying things that people wanted to hear. And when all that's taken into account, Trump ended up because everybody else finally dropped out <laughs> because there wasn't anybody left. And he handled almost everybody with a certain amount of brutality and ugliness, and none of us particularly liked that, but it's the way it worked. Then what happened? Well, he did have a lot of people who were driven, not, well, we really do like this guy. We can't wait for him to get elected. There were a lot more people probably that said, we don't want her. And a lot of people voted against her. And I think mm -hmm. the combination of those two elected him to the office that he's in right now. And I think a lot of us, myself included in this, have seen a certain number of things that we are very, very pleased with. Some of the things that he has said and done, everything from a Supreme Court nomination to a lot of the members of, of the cabinet and so forth, who by almost any measure are very, very well prepared and outstanding people. The question is, does he continue to do things that every time he does something that looks like, boy, that's a really great presidential type thing to do, he does something that none of us are particularly fond of. So, and main, meanwhile, the press is, he, it doesn't matter what this person does as president. The Democrats are gonna get on television that night and tell everybody he's a bad guy, and the print press will pick it up and tell everybody he's a bad guy. And in some respects, there are a lot of Republicans who don't like everything he's doing either, so his ratings are down. But I think time is going to tell a different picture. Over time, we'll find out. And it really will be whether or not he, coupled with the Senate and the House, can pass legislation that show that they really are very, very focused on doing things to make this country better. You, you mentioned the cabinet. There are two Georgians currently serving in the cabinet. Uh, former Governor Sonny Perdue, 
uh, and former Congressman Tom Price, who's running, uh, Sonny Perdue's running agriculture, and Tom Price is running health and human services. There was a special election not too far from here in the 6th Congressional District. Uh, very, very contentious race. Um, what made that race so, so close in 2006, or excuse me, in we, the 6th? We have never had that kind of race. It had nothing to do with how I voted. I couldn't. I'm not in that district. <laughs> right. It really had very little to do with the population of the 6th District. It mm -hmm. had everything to do with the worst thing that could have happened to the Republican Party was to have the first election that occurred really right after Trump went into office right. for it to be, be lost, particularly when he decided to embrace her and, and campaign for Karen Refer Handel, who got the Karen nomination. Right. The same thing is true on the other side. The worst thing that could have happened to the Democrats is for them not to win the first time they took it. So what did the Democrats do? Between the two campaigns, they sent, spent somewhere between 50 and $60 <laughs> million. Dollars. That is not just high. That means a substantial amount of that money came from outside of Georgia. Sure. A lot of it from Hollywood coming in through people that the Democratic Party had access to to give money because they did not want to lose this election. And money does mean something when you put it on television and both of them, what the same, Republicans were doing the same thing. Republicans right. brought in a lot of money right. from outside because the Republicans didn't want to lose. That was more of the dynamics than just what the two different candidates were saying. I think that's where the candidate, I think Karen ran a very good campaign. She had been elected, uh, she was in a runoff for governor eight years ago. Right. She had been elected uh, Secretary of State. She had also run Chairman of the Fulton County uh, Commission. She was very well qualified. She ran a good election. But when s the other party is just killing you with campaigns every 30 seconds, on that, it, it's going to pick up a lot of people. How many people do you not only go knock on their door and say, will you vote? I'll come by and pick you up. <laughs> and I'll tell you to take you to the voting booth, and that's that's the turnout. That's how you get people to go vote the way you want them to, and that campaign had more money spent to do that, and that's the only way I know to explain exactly what happened because it was very close, but it was expected from the beginning that it would be a very close election. Sure, sure. I mean, it, it's you know, the fact that they found forty-eight percent of the electorate in the sixth congressional district to vote for a Democratic candidate says something about. Not just the amount of money, I think, but the, the sort of operation that that sort of money was able to, to construct in a relatively short time. Looking ahead to, to 2018, um, actually, let's talk about 2017. There's going to be a mayor's race here in Atlanta. Kasim Reed has been mayor for, for eight years. Um, the leading candidate right now is, is actually a Republican, Mary Norwood, who is not just a Republican, but is also white, a, a white woman. Do you think Atlanta can, can, can elect a, a white female Republican mayor in 2017? Um, I think you will be surprised at the level of black vote she will get. She mm. has been on the city commission That's several um, a number of years, yeah. and she has just very, very, over the years, she has met with people across the, in this local meetings and so forth, mm -hmm. I think you'll find that an awful lot of the black vote likes her. And I think some of the earlier indications would indicate that. I think that she understands what needs to be done better than most candidates, and she's espousing that pretty well. But I think the, probably the real answer is, I don't think the 6th District does not have a whole lot, it, what, what Tom, Price won it with a 25-point right. lead or something right. like that and he, when he was last elected. So it's been a predominantly Democratic, I mean, Republican district. But I think that we did elect a Republican woman by having her, she won a primary. Right. Maybe we're all becoming a little bit more enlightened across the board and realize that it doesn't really matter what race you are or whatever. Do you really bring something to the table to discuss intelligently and do what's not just in, in favor of the particular con constituency that you represent, but is it really going to make this part of Georgia or this county or this area better because of the, what you want to see it like, not just right now, but five or ten years from now in terms of the direction of that 
area, you can always have a certain amount of personal interest or the interest of your constituents. That's the way politics works. But I think that I think that she does have a very good possibility. I also realize that what your, your question would imply, there's no doubt that one of the things that's been most meaningful to the African American community is that some time ago, an awful lot of the, what has happened in the area of civil rights was sort of born or at least mm -hmm. discussed or put on in the news every evening because of Atlanta's involvement with it. When Atlanta elected its first go governor, and he happened to be someone that went on to serve with distinction outside of just this state, but in, within at the federal level as well. And I think that what you've got right now is across the board, maybe more and more people, it's gonna be hard to beat anybody if there's a strong candidate running as a African American. Right. I don't know whether Reed would be elected if he could run for re-election, but he's out of the picture. I don't know whether there's a black candidate, he almost has, he or she almost has to cover the African American community primarily and cover it very well and get that vote. I don't know whether that's gonna happen, which is I think the heart of your question. Mm -hmm. I think that when you look at the meaning to the, the black community nationwide, Atlanta right in the midst of the South, uh, having elected a black leader for, for a number of years now, it's not a race they want to give up easily. Sure, sure. And I think that operates in their favor if they're able to turn that vote out because they really do want their candidate, but they may feel that maybe what they've seen from her, at least for enough of them to get some percentage of that vote would be, um, would be something that they would be very comfortable with. I don't know. We're going to find out here before too long. Um, looking ahead to 2018, um, there's another two-term incumbent leaving office. Governor Nathan Deal um, will be retiring from political life. Um, wh what is your assessment of the state of that, of that campaign, the, the campaign for uh, the Republican primary, um, for the Republican nomination? You have... Uh, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, who's been Lieutenant Governor since 2007. Um, you also have in that race the Secretary of State, a fellow Athenian uh, of mine, Brian Kemp. Um, and then also a pair of, I believe, state senators, uh, Hunter Hill um, and Mike Williams. So I'm sure somebody else might get in the race before for April, before next April. But what do you think, if, if you're willing to, to prognosticate a bit, what do you think you know, is going to be, what are going to be the defining issues of that Republican primary? I think that you um, may have answered it indirectly. I would not be surprised if there is not at least one, if not more than one candidate. Keep in mind, this race got started awfully early. It did. It I did. was trying to raise money for a Karen Handel and people were asking me to for, for, for a, a, you know, a, a governor's race and it was happening everywhere. That race got started early. They've still got a long time to go until the primary is over. And I think you're going to see uh, as people raise more money and they get out there and the real uh, interest is on the governor's race you're going to learn a lot more about which one of those people you've named by name I know that there's one other person who's giving very serious attention to it. I'm not going to get into it with you or anyone else right now because I have not decided right now who I think. I think there's some good candidates in the race. Sure. And I think that's what we all ought to do is get a pretty good feel for how good a governor will this person be. Not just someone that you like as your friend or whatever it is. Same thing ought to be true with the mayor's race, by the way. And I think that you're going to um, see that race become somewhat more competitive than it may appear right now. I don't think too many people, I think everybody's so tired of politics I right think now. You might and, be right. and being asked for another dollar <laughs> or whatever, it's kind of hard to get a real good feel for it. So it's name recognition. And name recognition comes through this technology we talked about a mm -hmm, while ago. Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways to get a different name out there that m nobody even knows right now or knows very well right now that will be different. Most of the campaigns will run in the very 
But nobody knew who Sonny Perdue was mm -hmm. a week or two out from the election. They did not know his name. Well, I th I, but we, the reason they did, we, we got the President of the United States to come out and put his arms around him and say this is my man. Tell us about that story. It's, it, it, that's a really good story. I think that pe people might enjoy hearing your interactions with the White House and sort of trying well, to Well, I don't want to take full credit for it. I well, will take credit for at least take raising the issue. Take as much as you'd like. Sonny had not really held statewide office, nor had um, Saxby Chambers. The two of them were running for, at the same time, mm -hmm. Saxby for the United States Senate, right. Sonny for governor. The White House, populated by George, H., George W. Bush, Karl Rove being sort of the political guy, chief, not chief of staff, but very close to the president, they were looking at making sure they elected another senator. They weren't quite mm -hmm. as concerned about the Senate, the, the governor's race. Saxby was running a pretty good race, but it looked like it would be very close. Sonny was running a race that was sort of surprising that he was doing pretty well, but he, the name recognition was not there. He had trouble running, raising money. But I can tell you right now, Georgia still has enough Democratic strength that if somebody is running, if, if Roy Barnes was the incumbent governor, mm -hmm. if somebody said, I'm going to vote for Sonny Perdue, and that person was in business, Roy Barnes would have made life miserable for that person from then on. They knew it. That was, made, that was one of the hardest things for the Republicans to overcome for a number of years and still was then. But what we did, we overcame it in a somewhat different race. I'm from Georgia. I've been involved in politics. I have lived in Atlanta. I've lived in South Georgia. I've watched every election. So it, without doing a whole lot of, of polling, I had a pretty good feel for how people would vote, but you needed to know who they were better. And I contacted Carl Rove and said, Carl, I think you're so focused on the, on the Senate race that you probably do not have a feeling as to whether or not Saxby can carry the state if Sonny is not running a strong race. Nobody knows Sonny. He doesn't have the money. I'm asking you to do two things. Let's have Sonny Perdue come to Washington, fly with the President of the United States down here, get off Air Force One with the President of the United States, take pictures of all of it, take pictures of the President saying nice things at a major fundraiser. We'll put the fundraiser together, we'll raise a lot of money, and all of a sudden people will know him because the United States President that all the Republicans in the state loved at that point in time, mm -hmm. the best way for him to have gotten elected and take that money and put all that on television for the next week. And if you do that, Sonny will, Sonny will have enough following to get the vote that you needed. Those two candidates ended up with exactly the same numerical count. The vote came from different areas. I believe neither one of them would have lucked that had we not been able to make both of them turn their vote out. Sonny didn't have enough money. We did when a week before, and that's when name recognition zoomed. And I think it's an interesting aspect of when you, questions you've asked before is how how do you know right now? Well, everybody does polls, but we've seen over and over and over and over polling's really gotten, it's either so poorly conducted or it really does, people aren't telling the truth or whatever it is. But that was a great example of looking at it a little bit differently. What do you really need to do in these last few weeks? Do it now. If Sonny hears me say that, he'll probably say, no, it was because of my endearing personality or whatever, <laughs> but I'm not trying to take the other, I'm telling you factually what did occur. Mm -hmm. Not that it was so brilliant as much as it did work. But I also think we did not take any votes away from S Saxby because Sonny turned out such vote, it, it accrued to whoever was running for them, and both of them got the same amount, which was not an absolutely landslide election for either one of them, but it worked together. And in his, fa in his defense, Carl Rove came back and said, I've done some polling, you're right. <laughs> and but they did it. But the, he, the point is they weren't so stubborn. They said, no, we're going to do it this thing our way. We're going to let us in. We don't care who your governor is. And they came across and they ended up with two of them that were very, very good. In 2010, there was another relatively unexpected um, result from the Republican primary. I think if you ask most political observers or political watchers in Georgia uh, at the end of qualifying in, in April of 2010, who's going to win the Republican nomination? I don't think many of them said, well, we could go back and look, I don't think many of them said Congressman Nathan Deal is going to be the 
the Republican Party's nominee. How was he able to, to secure the nomination uh, for the Republican, uh, the, the governor's race in 2010, in your estimation? He had been a congressman. Right. He had changed parties from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Um, it ended with a very, very close race in the primary between him and Karen Hannah. Very close. I very shared close. Karen Hannah's campaign right. that year, just so you will know that. Oh, I'm yes. Making all for, of this. For the stuff. record. But the reason I say it is that I think that um, money had more to do with it. Nathan okay. uh, had been able to raise more money. Um, I think Karen ran a good race, but I think that she did not run as good a race then as she ran just a couple months ago when she ran for the congressional seat. I don't think, I think it was a surprise, and I think that, you know, I think it was close enough to get the nomination. I think had Karen won the nomination, she would have been elected governor. Sure. I think it was just that close, and what did happen, the party was split to some extent with other people, some of them because they were pretty far to the religious right, some of them for different reasons. And I think that um, with the benefit of hindsight, you always try to look back and see what you learned from it. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, uh, my belief is that Nathan did not, Nathan came in under us unusual circumstances. He was being looked at by the House of Representatives. I think he felt the best thing for him to do and to simply to get out of the House was to resign, but then have an excuse for resigning and running for governor. I don't think that he expected he would win, but he did, which means that you have to, in the final analysis, give him pretty good marks for running a good campaign. That probably means that either it was better than Karen's or Karen's wasn't as good as it should have been or whatever, and that's the reason maybe it was the person who was chairing the campaign that, that fouled it up, but I don't think so. I think it was just an unusual um, thing. I don't think that gender had anything to do with it. Right. It was so close. And I think that um, I don't I don't remember the different candidates that were that were not in the in the runoff, the ones that fell aside, how their strength played in that runoff. I, I, I um, you, you had um, John Oxendine, who was a, he was uh, insurance commissioner for since ninety five, I believe. Um, so name recognition wise was there, but also um, State Senator Eric Johnson um, from, from Chatham County. And there was another one, uh, another legislator from like Brunswick area, Chapman, I think. Yes, but he was not a strong candidate, but Eric right, Johnson was, candidate. I think he was the one who was in the Republican almost, Party. Almost made the, the, the runoff. Exactly. Um, but I don't, um, you know, I think that you had good candidates in it, but you know, do the people who, you know, you don't feel real good when you wake up and you realize you just got shoved aside. Right. You don't turn all your people loose to vote for a particular candidate. You could really give a rip at that point <laughs> about who wins or loses. And I think if you don't have enough of that, um, you know, going, you, you just don't win the primary. And I don't, I don't really know. I, as I, said, I don't think agenda had anything to do with it. She had shown that she was a pretty good candidate statewide, mm -hmm. but I think that you, you never really know what are the things in the last few minutes that, you know, I think that Karen's, um, I think that the work that she did in running the campaign in terms of, of the um, television spots were pretty good. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there was a f real flaw there, but um, you know, just it, it, in the final analysis, the answer to your question is just how people felt the morning they got up and voted. <laughs> That's a pretty pretty good explanation. Now, did you serve in a similar capacity in 2014 um, for for Miss um, Handel's uh, Senate campaign? No, I did not. You did not. But I did something. I didn't support anybody. Okay. Eric Tannenblatt and I put together something that was rather unique. We realized that in the presidential races, at least, we had had so many people running in the primary that they raised a lot of money, they spent it all trying to make the other guy look bad, and they were stone broke. <laughs> so they didn't have any money to run against the Democratic candidate. Right. Because they had spent it all, and they had beat up each other. Nobody emerged clean as a whistle. Everybody had been accused of some bad behavior or whatever. Absolutely. We realized that if we had that happen in the Senate race, we knew we'd probably have a number of candidates in out running. We also knew who the Democratic candidate would yes. be. 
We knew that it would be the daughter of a former well-regarded senator, Stan Dunn, that she would be able to raise a whole lot of money so when she didn't have any opposition in the Democratic primary. So she emerges on the primary day. She's won the primary. She's clean as a whistle. Nobody's criticized her. She's got a whole lot of money. And we didn't know who our candidate was going to be because we had a runoff at right. the end. Right. So we raised money for whoever got the nomination. And neither Eric nor I ever said who we're for. Nobody knows to this day. It made a couple of people mad. I'll tell you that um, one or both of them may have been in the runoff. <laughs> but we knew that what we really, uh, we wanted to make sure we got a good candidate out of it, and we did. And I think that it was when he hit the road running the day he was elected with a nice war chest of money, and then he could raise a whole lot more because he'd just gotten the nomination. Sure. So he didn't have that blip where she was calling him everything in the book and he was sitting there, can't respond to her. And it worked. And I thought it was much better than me just getting behind the candidate that I wanted. Give it to the person who got the vote of the Republicans in the, in the, in the nominating process. When you, when you think back, you know, we, we touched on how there were five, we've gone, you've gone from in, in terms of politics, place where there were five state senators, 10 or 11 uh, Republican representatives in the state house yes. to now super um, close to super majorities in, in both of the, the state legislatures uh, or houses of the state legislature. So what I'm saying is the, the bench for future and potential candidates is very deep for the Republican Party. Yes. Who do you see as some of the, the you know, the future um, stars or the, the future um, you know, candidates of the Republican Party here in Georgia, people that you know aren't on the political radar now, but who might be on that political radar in in the next cycle or a few cycles down. If the you road. had asked me that just a few years ago, I would have been close enough. But the people in the General Assembly today are holding office somewhere else, even a congressman or, or, mm -hmm. or woman. Mm -hmm. I could not tell you in good conscience, I think this is a real superstar coming sure. along because I don't think it's appropriate for me to look at it with all the different people. I think you said it right, the, the, our bench, our farm team, we didn't have any people right. waiting to run when we had a, a, a good bench. Look at, look at what we had to do. We didn't have anybody who had Mattingly. Nobody knew Mattingly. Nobody knew Newt. And yet, we had two people who were willing to, who picked a good time mm -hmm. and picked a good candidate to win it, run against. But I think your, your, your thought process is, I hope we've got a ho whole lot of people out there that hold an office, and it may be mayor of a city or something that is different than we even think about it. But I, I am sure that I know what it's, it's done for us in the past we didn't have just one person running for the United States Senate or one person running for governor or one person running for a lot of different offices because we had such a good uh, backup. Already people who were well regarded and had either, they, and they may have been someone who just was well known in business or whatever it was that's been sort of getting a lot of publicity that may emerge as a very strong candidate in the future. Right, you never know when there's well, a real estate mogul. David, right? David Perdue had a right. good name Right, right. But that's all, that's why all people knew about him. Sure, sure. I, I, as a way of sort of you know wrapping all this up, you've sort of ex you were in that transition from the Republican Party as sort of a an afterthought here in Georgia in terms of organizational strength um, to to now a majority party. Where do you see the role um, of political parties in 10, 20 years. We're living in the days of super PACs and, and the ability to raise millions of dollars on the internet from anybody. Um, what, does the, what does the Republican Party look like? What do political parties look like? How will they function? Or what do you see their role in, in, in sort of the day-to-day the -day politics and policy in the future? Is it going to be the same? Is I'm, it going to be different? I'm not going to answer your last question by saying I don't know. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I don't know because I really can't predict the future. I will predict what I think has to if only we could. have been done by both parties. I think the Democratic Party needs to be um, redefined in a way that um, uh, would cause a lot of people who have very different views of the role of government 
but none of them would sort of drift into it because their granddaddy was a Republican, was a Democrat or whatever. I've already said repeatedly, I think the real problem is for the D Republicans to make sure they know what they stand for. What does the word conservative mean today? Does it mean you're a pretty far right religious person? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that you believe that capitalism is what made this country so great because of what it stood for in terms of our economy? And yet we're not talking about it. And yet it's such a beautiful, wonderful, meaningful story to tell over and over. But people lock into a particular thing that's maybe popular in this part of, of one state and maybe different somewhere else. So I think that the party does need to be defined. Right now, we're defining it by who our president is. And I've got to tell you that I, don't th I think the jury is going to, uh, hopefully, the jury is going to be out. But we also have questions about the leadership. I don't have them in both the House and Senate at the federal level. Are these people really in good leadership positions that they can make things happen? And is the president going to be helpful in getting that done? I think if he didn't have so many people, primarily the press, saying bad things about him every day, he would not be uh, in the exact posture he's in. But he's his own worst enemy by tweaking things, or what do you call Twitter or whatever yeah, it is. Tweeting. I don't understand these words. <laughs> enough. He is tweeting every night still. Oh, yeah, and morning. And I don't think that's all helpful, but I think that he has demonstrated there's enough s substance there that hopefully with some of the people he's already appointed, maybe it's from others that come in, and if he frankly would just could possibly be made to behave more presidential, because he has shown he can do that very well. So I don't know. I think that he, what he does, the Republican Party necessarily will live and die, hopefully for the next eight, seven years now, or more than yeah. that, uh, will depend on what he has done and who he was. The Democratic Party has to live with who their last president was. I think a lot of people thought it was wonderful when he was elected, and a lot of people really wondered whether this man really was doing what was best for America. Look at some of the decisions he made with wars that are open right now that uh, he was not particularly helpful in his le leadership of what's happening in the Mideast, or quite frankly, exactly what could have perhaps been started a little bit earlier in, with respect to Iran as well as China and all the things that are happening on an international level right now. So that's about as close as I can come to saying I don't know and playing like I'm not saying <laughs> I don't know because I don't think anybody knows. I don't think there's a great person who understands politics beautifully that can tell you because it's so mixed right now that um, each party probably has a pretty wide array of people who are right. Democrats for some reason or Republicans for a different reason. And I think that it's, it, right now it's hard to get the Republicans to agree on what's the right thing for them to do in a legislative fashion. Can they agree on what's the best way to define their own party? I and, would, and would the Democrats, or could the Democrats, same thing we said about the Republicans, obviously, can, can, can the Democrats or the Republicans come to grips with a mission statement of exactly what we both stand, each other stands for? Do you think that's a problem? I, I know I said we were going to wrap it up, but is, is that a problem in Washington and a problem in Atlanta under the Gold Dome? Or do you think that's a, a problem that's more acute to sort of the national political landscape. I think Republican. I think this state is more conservative. Translate that to me, more Republican. Okay. Yeah, they'll have battles in this Gold Dome, but not battles that are really fought among each other. Name two or three very far left liberal states. Well, so let's start with California. Sure. Let's go next to maybe New York, and then Illinois, and then probably. Uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. are those states going to be able to um, get their act straight? Probably not. Those three states are going to probably always be what they are, and I think probably Georgia will always be more conservative. It may very well be the parties get realigned. Maybe if everybody becomes in independent and says, I'm going to vote however I want to. I can tell you what I basically am, but I'm tired of this party that I'm in or whatever. I'm not predicting that. I hope that most people, I hope that the, I think the, Party politics is an important part because you do need just simply the sheer size and financial capacity to put the money together right. and the organizational tools and so forth to make the party 
aspect and all the rules that apply right now. You don't want to be changing all of those, but eventually we don't know what will happen. That the parties have changed a good bit over the last 20 years, for heaven's sake. Sure. Was well, there anything else we we haven't talked about, we haven't touched on? Well, that you'd I like? could think of something I didn't want to tell you. I'm certainly not going to suggest it, so <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. No, what I, you were looking for and whether or not I've been as responsive as you had hoped I would be. I, I think you, you've gone above and beyond. Um, and I, I know I, I appreciate it. Um, the Russell well, I'm, Library I'm appreciates I'm going to tell you it. one personal oh, story real quickly if I may. Sure, absolutely. I have told you this, but I think it's interesting from my standpoint. Yeah. I was elected chairman of the Republican Party in 1981. I did not know until some time after that that my maternal grandfather had been elected president because he was asked by the then governor, president, excuse me, Warren Harding, to create a Republican Party in the state of Georgia. This would have been in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was, what, 60 years later when I was elected. I didn't Almost I, exact, yeah. I, um, I knew he had been a Republican because he was the only Republican in Thomasville, Georgia. That was what <laughs> I knew. I did not know he had served in that capacity. And it was also a similar thing that you hinted at a couple of times of a split within the Republican Party that he was trying to put together a Republican Party that would be operative. Mm -hmm. I sort of came into the same situation, and yet I'm not sure that I fully understood it until I dived into the water and realized the party is badly split between people who have very, very different objectives and goals. And yet I think that the time and energy I and a lot of other people have spent and the final analysis has helped us have what you really want is competition. Because just like I say it works in a capitalistic society, it also works if you just simply transpose that concept. Is a party better if you have a lot of people who are arguing for different ways to handle certain problems, better ideas? Now, in a perfect world, it's some Democratic ideas and some Republican ideas, and the ones that sort of work well together, they bring them together and they compromise and they get something that everybody's happy with because it's a happy compromise. Right now, that's not happening at the national scene. But within the party, it ought to. I can't believe that the Republicans could not come up with a legislative answer to Obamacare that would not, it would have made them, they had so many years, they were all talking about it. Why weren't they doing something better? The same thing is true right now. We're debating exactly what the uh, tax uh, legislation should look like, why have we not organized ourselves where we put behind us with some type of compromise among the different, that's what it's supposed to do. The House votes first, it comes right. out of a committee. When it comes out, it goes over to the Senate. They renegotiate it sort of, and they come together with a conference committee of the two who comes up with something that then the only question is, will the president sign it? And I think there has to be more of that understanding of the process we've just kind of gotten away with Two or three people are going to do what they think will get them reelected. How many Democrats were in favor of doing anything to help with Obamacare? How many Democrats will be in favor of something that is meaningful tax reform? It, it, it means so much to this country. Right now you've got this new problem of a multi-billion dollar cost that's just erupted in the state of Texas. You're not, nobody's going to stand on the side and say that's their problem because it shouldn't be. That's part of what the federal government should be for, but now how they're going to pay for other things this year. And that's the type of thing that smart men and women of good reason and thoughtfulness ought to be able to come together and resolve it. And somehow you've got to have more leadership in the final now. Leadership ought to be something other than if you do what I tell you to do, I'll make you chairman of the such and such committee. Well, that's just unbelievable. That's what happens. Or I will not take you off of that committee <laughs> or whatever it is in reverse. And I think this, that's politics, but politics right. has gotten pretty rude and crude and ugly. And I think we got to elect people who are, who are not going to be uh, treated that way, who will simply stand up for what they know is right. They're statesmen. They're people who are patriotic. And those people exist. Well, why aren't there more? Why aren't those models on both sides of the fence? where you really understand why the, what governs the other side and have a practical answer to why what our solution is better, but why don't we compromise and do a little bit over here 
so that we can get something passed. And that's the nature of politics also, to compromise in good faith, not just say it my way or no way, because that doesn't work too well. If we continue having an absolute standoff on which side of the aisles, whether it's the House and the Senate, boy, this is going to be a tough battle. And I don't know how you predict the ultimate outcomes from that. So stop asking me <laughs> how, I would, how I would tell you to work, because I don't think anybody can tell you right now. Well, I think that is a good place to, to, to leave off. Mr. Fred Cooper, thank you very much. On behalf of the Richard B. Russell Library uh, at the University of Georgia, this has been the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much, for not only for inviting me, but more importantly, because I think without your in, insightful questions, this would have been a far <laughs> more dull session to be with. So this has been an, an enjoyable exchange between you and me both. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.